Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. And Carlin, also thank you for coming. Um, his research is um, focuses on the erasure of black legacies in the American South and how this exploration influences one's personhood. He currently lives in central Arkansas and earned his MFA at the University of Arkansas and his BA in journalism at DePaul University. Um, his work has been shown in many places, um, exhibitions and in publications. Most notably, um, his work is published in the New York Times, the British Journal of Photography and the Atlantic. So without further ado. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brooke. It's great to be here. Um, pardon me if I speak a little slowly. I'm not jet lagged, but more um, car lagged. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Drove a lot overnight. Um, but let's get into it. So I wanted to start off this presentation not really talking about the work that I've been making a lot more recently, um, but starting it off kind of where um, my photographic practice began to get a little bit more serious. Um, so I started making pictures at 23 years old when I moved to Los Angeles and I was making a lot of street photographs until I decided that grad school might be something I want to pursue. And that brought me to where my family's from in Wadmala, South Carolina. Um, Right outside of Charleston, along the sea islands of South Carolina, um, is Wadmala Island, uh, which is where my family has been since the 1840s, according to U.S. Census records. So when I went out there in 2018, um, I had been reading a lot about contemporary Gullah Geechee culture, a culture that is, um, stems from all the way to the North, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, down to Northern Florida. Um, but I was really interested in this one specific island that I knew growing up as a place where I spent family reunions. It's a place where I would go and see my grandmother. Um, but of course, I was interested in what was there now. And I hadn't been there in well over 10 years. And for me, it was a bit of a homecoming, but it was also familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. And that balance of unfamiliarity with familiarity um, is something that's like a prevalent theme throughout my work. Um, so I was knocking on doors, I was talking to people that I thought were strangers, but they were actually family members of mine. And I was questioning um, them about the power of land and what, um, and what property ownership means to them. Um, Wadmala Island in 1998 was 98% black. Uh, when I started this project in 2018, it's now about 50-50. So I realized that land had been lost from families um, through generations. Um, and then people were also leaving. A lot of young people weren't staying, and my family included. The majority of my family members at one point, who were all in South Carolina, uh, ended up going to New York City. Um, and most of them eventually come back in older age. So. A lot of this research that I was doing was meeting with pro bono attorneys who understand uh, the controversial system of heirs property, which leads to land loss. Um, and then I was also meeting with members of the National Park Service who helped establish the Gullah Geechee National Heritage Corridor. That is a mouthful. Um, but the first, I'd say, year and a half, two years, I was going to Wadmala, I was going to Buford, I was going to Georgetown. And I was speaking with folks um, to ask them what practices, what rituals from their upbringing do they still hold on to today? And a lot of this isn't like Gullah Geechee traditions, right? It's more like family stuff, personal things. Um, but at the same time, I was familiar with ritualistic practices within Gullah Geechee culture, which all stems from like West African traditions, right? So. Um, I spent about a year trying to find a root work doctor, um, and I was pretty unsuccessful. Uh, root work is very similar to, to, voodoo, to voodoo down in New Orleans, and it's very much like a hush-hush thing that no one really talks about. So I was trying to speak with people, uh, and that wasn't really successful, so I ended up just kind of making my own imaginary images. Um, um, that alludes to a lot of those root work practices, specifically the ring shouts that you would see in churches. So after going there for about two years and going to different islands, um, I decided that Wadmala was the place I wanted to focus on. 
Um, it was the place that wasn't at most risk for land displacement to climate change and didn't have the worst like property loss, but it was the, the island that I had the most connection to. So I kept returning. And the last time I was there was in about 2020, yeah, at the end, near the end of that year into January of 2021. I like to think of this work as something that's still ongoing. Um, it definitely informed how my practice was going to move uh, in the later years. And it also helped me understand how to approach people, how to speak with people. Um, granted, I did have the benefit of just mentioning my last name and I could get access. People would let me in their homes. People would let me sit on their couch and talk to them for hours and then hopefully photograph them. I don't see Wadmala changing that much. Uh, right now, there's no public city water, um, which uh, prevents commercial businesses from ever developing on Wadmala Island. So the only businesses that you see, which is like the barber shop and Middleton's Grocery, those are more like grandfathered in, and those are black owned. On my last visit, my grandmother was going to back to the island uh, to attend a funeral. And I randomly asked her where her great, great, her great grandmother was, which would be my great, great grandmother. And she said it was behind my great grandmother's house, which was the first photo of the wall with the, the portraits on it. And I spent a good couple days while I was in Wadmala um, looking for my great, great grandmother's um, burial ground, which wouldn't look like this, like a tombstone, but more of like a tiny aluminum placard. Um, and through decades and decades of like storms and hurricanes, like it's probably under a lot of debris. Um, so I couldn't find it, but it's something I want to go back and, and keep looking for. Um, and this photo doesn't do it justice. It's kind of hard to photograph all of it. But about a mile behind my great grandmother's house is the sacred burial ground with over 30 headstones. And these are just four of them. And these have just been sitting there for you know, almost 100 years. Some of them, the oldest one I saw was in the 1890s. So it's very, very old. Going back to the young people, um, if I were to travel out there again, not if, but when I do, um, I'm not sure when it will be. Um, it's kind of hard for me to get out there these days, um, but I'm really interested in focusing on the young people who continue to live on these islands. Um, the young people who didn't really grow up with this culture um, to the extent that my grandmother did. My grandmother is one of 5,000 people in this country who can still speak Gullah fluently. Um, so it's very much like a dying history, right? Um, but young people are very, very difficult to find. And when you do find them, um, you have to approach them. And it's more like kind of a sales pitch. And I think a lot of photographers um, would say that. And, some might be afraid to, but when you're going to a place where people are unfamiliar with you, like you do need to um, explain your intentions and explain like how this work is going to come about and explain what you're actually doing and what you're trying to, to talk about with your images. Um, and I let people know that up front um, when I approach them. This was taken on New Year's Day in 2021. And I think this could be one of the last images from, from Wadmala. So I wanted to show this just because I haven't shown it a lot in like the last two years, but it's work that means a lot to me that I really need to continue. Um, like I need, need to continue it, it's been a while. Um, but making that work um, got me into grad school and I moved to Arkansas and I left Los Angeles. So I started um, figuring out what ways I could figure out the South Carolina work in Arkansas, and that was pretty unsuccessful. I wasted about a month in grad school figuring that out. I was planning shoots with people, and I was trying to shoot in a way that was less direct and less representational, that involved, involved a lot more like um, interpretation of like what you're seeing. Um, and that isn't really the direction I wanted to go in with the Wadmala work, so I stopped it. Um, but the summer before I started my graduate program, um, I was taking a course titled Intersectional Practice with my professor, Zora J. Murph. And we were looking at lynching photographs for about a week. Um, 
And that's when I stumbled upon the history of the Red Summer of 1919. And it's this one specific summer where you had racial violence all across the country, going from Maine all the way down to Florida, all the way west to New Mexico. And if you look at like the chronological order of events, it's pretty much like every month, every other week, there's something going on in this country in that summer. You had a lot of World War I veterans coming home, a lot of black American soldiers returning to the United States only to face um, a tougher enemy when they returned back to their homeland. Um, and that's when I found out that one of the worst racial massacres, of course, during this time was the Elaine massacre in 1919. And that's how I, like most people, find out about Elaine. Um, I didn't know anyone in Elaine before going out there. I didn't reach out to anyone before going out there. Um, it was more of a sense of urgency since I wasted that first month in grad school um, figuring out the Wadmala work. Um, so I knew I needed to just go out there and just do something. I just want, at that point, I just wanted to see it, see what it looked like. Um, because when you Google Elaine, you're not going to find much information um, post massacre, right? Like anything from like the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, Elaine might as well have not existed because online you're not really finding anything. Um, and that kind of forced me to go out there earlier than I had thought. Um, I did a little bit of research, but again, you're not going to find much information besides the massacre. Um, but I did find out that schools closed in 2005. So when I started this project in September of 2020, um, kids were going to school two days a week because of COVID. Um, I was in grad school um, on Zoom because of COVID. So I didn't have to physically be in Northwest Arkansas. So I was on the road a lot. Um, I like to say that I, I like lived in my car that year because I drove like well over 40,000 miles just being in Elaine. Um, and it started off pretty simple um, for my first visit. This is the image of the basketball court that I saw in September 2020. It's not the most impressive image, but it means a lot to me just because that landscape has changed um, almost completely in the last three years. Um, but for my first visit, you know, I'm going out there shooting medium and large format film, and I'm always bringing my digital camera. And there was this simple casual exchange um, from the first visit where I'm giving kids my digital camera and they're making their own images. And it started off as something where I'm like looking over them to see, to make sure they're good with the camera, because it's quite an expensive digital camera that they're using. Um, but then over the years, it's turned into a thing where I can like leave town for like a weekend and come back and they still have the camera. Um, so we were doing that for a couple months. Mind you, I'm also in grad school, so I'm going a little bit back and forth. Um, but also during that time, I'm asking a lot of questions um, because I want to know about the social relations, the social dynamics of this place. And you're only going to figure those things out by talking to people. And much like Wadmala, um, it was kind of a trickle effect. Like I was talking to this person. They told me to knock on this person's door, so I talked to that person. Elaine is less than 500 people. It's really small. Uh, so the black community of Elaine is like 200 something people. So it's not really easy to meet everybody, but it's easy for people to understand um, or to realize who you are pretty quickly. Um, this is an image that I made over the span of three years. And it's this hanging tree that you see um, as soon as you enter in town and as soon as you exit out of town. And over three years, it has slowly decayed um, a lot of the elders who I spoke with were told that this was historically like where they hung people in Phillips County. Um, and obviously it's no longer, it's no longer there for a lot of people to see as they enter and exit throughout the town. Um, I just want to pause on this uh, to let you all know that there is a memorial for this massacre, but it is not in Elaine. And I found this out pretty late, probably like six minutes into the work. Um, it's about 25 miles, over a 30-minute drive from Elaine, and it was funded by the Solomon family, um, who was a family that participated in this massacre. Um, they own a lot of land within Phillips County. Um, they don't have many ties to the land, like personally, at this moment. A lot of them live in the state of New York. Um, but to this day, it's the only memorial I've ever seen without any, any names written on it. And I've yet to photograph it. I've seen it twice. I 
don't think I was ready to photograph it until this past summer. So that's something I hope to do in the near future. So while I was doing, uh, making this work throughout this first year, um, of course, this exchange with the camera is getting me, um, is building my relationship with these kids and also to the parents and these families. Um, but then it was also attending church services and speaking to congregations where I was really able to let the community know who I was, even if I couldn't really speak to what I was trying to do, because I, I didn't wholeheartedly, I didn't really understand it like in year one. I just knew I needed to go out there and make work. Um, but throughout this whole time, I'm bringing back prints. Since I'm in grad school, it's easy for me to make prints and just give them to people. And so every portrait you're seeing, like every person has their print, right? And whether it's in their home or somewhere else. Um, so, <clears throat> so every person, every adult, every kid uh, has seen their image and they also own it. Um, so throughout my first summer, um, I would have been 2021 and into 2022, uh, both of those summers, I was able to do some photo workshops where I was bringing down a scanner um, some external strobe lighting, uh, tripods, of course, cameras, and then also like a small Epson desktop printer. And kids were able to make their own photographs, edit them, and then also make their own prints. And that only lasted for about a month and a half each summer. And it was like three days a week, um, just because at the time it was a five hour drive away from me. Um, but that also built our relationship quite a bit. And you know, this project, comes in ebbs and flows. Like I'm able to be out there consecutively for a little bit and then I return to school and then there's some distance. And when you go like a month, two months without any communication, um, I wouldn't say it sets you back, but it changes the course moving forward. Like when you return, in my opinion, um, I wouldn't say it made it a little more difficult, but kids ask where you've been and you just have to say that you've been in school. Um, so I was really taking advantage of my summers while I was there, but then at the same time, I also had to figure out what my thesis work was going to be. I went to a three-year program, so I knew I didn't want the Elaine work to be a part of my thesis. Um, I was very territorial over this work. I still am. Um, a lot of the information I found out about this place is very much firsthand accounts, and um, it's sensitive information. It's It's not... It's not light, it's pretty heavy. Um, Elaine is still as racially divided as it was in 1919, some would say even worse. Um, it's right along Main Street, which is the main street in town. Um, and there's not much of a crossover. It's rare that you're going to see white people on the black side of town, vice versa. Um, and I knew that quickly, uh, making images there. But you know, this is still a place where rumors Right. And gossip will spread throughout a town and instill fear in people, just like it did in 1919, which ignited the massacre. And that's those types of things still happen to this day. Um, I was told that in 2019, for the hundredth uh, commemoration of this tragedy, um, every white person left town on that day because they were told in a rumor that there was going to be thousands of black people arriving to the town. Um, and that wasn't one person who told me that. Several different people have told me that story. Um, so it's still like that in Phillips County. Um, yeah. So a couple of things have changed since I've started um, focusing on this work in the last like year. Um, I kind of stopped doing the workshops with the children. I'm still interested in putting cameras in their hands and letting them photograph. Um, I think at first in the beginning, I was thinking about how to teach them the technical aspects behind the camera. Um, not really interested in that. I'm more interested in like building their visual literacy and hopefully, hopefully making this town um, exist in a better way to them. But at the same time, like that's not something um, that I'm really, I'm really pressed on, I'm like committing to. Um, I'm more interested in, in building something and actually causing, creating some type of social change in this place. Um, I've been saying the last two years, I envision this work existing as like this evolving archive that you would only be able to see if you go to Elaine. 
Um, and that was going to be in the Civil Rights Museum that was going to be built right along Main Street here. And I just want to pause on this image because there is one thing you will see if you Google Elaine, um, and that is that it's America's birdhouse capital. Um, and that's entirely fake news. It's not a real thing. Um, birdhouses are not even like a cultural object of the Arkansas Delta. Um, but in the last couple of years, like five years, um, um, you will now see more birdhouses than people in Elaine. And that's because a couple actually from where I went to grad school in Fayetteville, Arkansas, um, went down there and opened up a storefront in hopes of kind of re, uh, creating a narrative of, of the origins of this town. Um, and birdhouses have nothing to do with that narrative. So moving forward, uh, when making and producing more work, I'm interested in incorporating text into a lot of these images, um, specifically text that like talks about, um, very direct problems I see with Elaine. This doesn't have to be like the opinions of the people I photograph, but it's really me uh, putting my input um, into the work as well. So I put lots of housing options for the birds in Elaine. If you wanted to move to Elaine, um, you couldn't. There's no housing. Um, there's not proper infrastructure. Um, the plumbing is not that great. Water is not that great as well. Um, there's no jobs in Elaine, right? Like there's nowhere to be employed. So a lot of people are either relying on government assistance, they're retired, or they're working in Helena, which is about 30 minutes away. Um, so a lot of people are kind of going through this cycle of either working a farm job, a seasonal farm job, and then um, collecting money or um, being unemployed and collecting a government check. And it's a way to like kind of keep you in this vortex of poverty, right? If you make too much money, you no longer get government assistance. If you don't make enough, you get assistance, but it's only to keep you at a certain level. Um, and a lot of people are experiencing that in Phillips County in general. So this past summer, um, I had to reroute how this project was going to be. Um, the Elaine Civil Rights Museum was supposed to be opening. I've been talking about it for the last two years. Uh, the city of Elaine received a generous grant from the National Historic Preservation Fund. And um, unfortunately, a lot of that money um, was misspent, uh, mismanaged, and $400,000 was basically wasted. Um, so you'll soon see a photograph of the Civil Rights Museum, if I haven't passed it already. Um, and that's not gonna be happening. And I took that photograph about two years ago and it doesn't look much different from how it does now. And I was just there last weekend. Um, there it is. And this is in one of the few buildings that was actually um, around at the time of the 1919 massacre. Um, in fact, James White, who's someone I work with very closely, he's the person who runs the Elaine Legacy Center, which is in the old elementary school. And that's where I did a lot of my photo workshops over the summer. You know, as a child, he was somebody that had to like enter through the back of this building. So he knows it, knows it very well. And it meant a lot to him for a civil rights center and a memorial to be housed inside of this building that's right on the corner of Main Street. Um, you can't go to Elaine and not drive by this building. Um, however, uh, I don't think it was practical for a civil rights museum in a place like Elaine. So. This title has now recently changed to Elaine Civil Rights Museum or what could have been. Um, I think they were relying on a lot of tourism dollars um, to come through, but Elaine is so remote and so rural that one, I don't think it, was sustain it would have been sustainable to have a civil rights museum. I don't, I don't see that being something that would have been around for like three or even five years. Um, so, how I envision this work existing as an archive has changed a little bit, and I'll get into that. Um, this is a photograph of the plot of land that Richard Wright lived on. Um, he talks about it in chapter two of his novel, Black Boy, in which he uh, describes his uncle being killed in the Elaine Massacre. And to this day, he's the only, I think, notable figure I know from Elaine. Um, Richard Wright, of course, also wrote Native Son. Um, and it took talking to a lot of different people to figure out where this plot of land would have been. Um, yeah, and then the, the, the picture that's like kind of in the middle there is just like from Google Images, yeah. 
a lot of Photoshop. Um, so um, I'm still doing a lot of portraiture. There's photos that I want to make uh, that I don't need to make anymore. Um, or there's photos that I want to make, there's photos that I don't need to make anymore, and there's photos that like I'm just tired of seeing. Uh, this work is still building, but I'm probably done with making portraits of people sitting down. Um, that's just like you see a lot within this work, but I think it also speaks to like my relationship to a lot of the people. Um, as you look at this work, especially if you were to see it like in chronological order and how it was taken, um, I get closer and people allow me to get closer. And that's just like a natural thing that I just think will happen over time. Um, people are very much guarded, right? I'm not the first photographer. I'm not the first um, writer to go into Elaine, right? I was told National Geographic, The Guardian, um, so many Smithsonian Magazine and so many others have been to Elaine to cover um, the massacre there and the aftermath of that massacre. Um, but I assured people like from day one that I would keep returning and I would keep coming back. Um, and I think photographically, like I'm always interested in artists who like can keep, uh, can keep returning to a place and just photographing the same environment. Um, granted, I'm doing other work, making other things, um, but I think this project will go on for like a very, very long time. Um, but now that the Civil Rights Museum isn't happening, um, I've shifted, I've shifted a lot of things. I'm still going out there to make photos, but this work to me is not really about the photos. The photos is like a byproduct of the community engagement that I'm participating in with these people. And, um, going back to creating actual social change, um, I'm figuring out ways I can use these photos. Uh, to create something. Elaine doesn't have a community center. There's no place for people to gather besides churches. Um, and I think this work, one, can actually build something in that town. Um, so this past summer, I went to my first arts residency in, in Maine, of all places, and um, those were a lot of the conversations I had, um, was how I can use these photos to create some type of infrastructure that's sustainable. And the easiest thing for me that I thought of was to open up a community center that serves as a laundromat. Um, so in the next year, that's what my primary focus is right now, um, is to create a nonprofit, to have a board for this nonprofit, and for it to be a community center that also functions as a place where people can do laundry. Um, laundry is one of the few things that people have to go to Helena, 30 minute drive each way to do which is crazy. Um, so I'm being realistic with myself and thinking about things that I'm actually capable of doing, um, but also doing something that can benefit people that are there and then also future generations. And I think it's something that could start off like a building and then maybe it could be a couple buildings together, um, but it's gonna take a lot of money and a lot of people. But fortunately, this work, um, I think, can appeal to a lot of institutions that are willing to get behind this cause. Um, so the laundromat idea stems a little bit from some of the contemporary artists that I've seen uh, working a lot um, in social practice, specifically um, uh, Rick Lowe, who runs the project Row Houses out in Houston, and then also uh, Theaster Gates um, and his Reform Foundation in Chicago, in which he like bought up buildings and made them into artist studios. And I'm less interested in creating something for artists or any, uh, any of that, but really just creating something for these kids to have. Um, Cause right now these kids just have a basketball court and that's it. Um, so when these kids hit 18, which some of them are 18 now, um, and they, when we started this project, they were like 15. Um, you know, a lot of parents want them to leave. Some want them to stay because, believe it or not, Elaine is one of the safest places you could probably be. Um, I was warned early by like my grandparents who live in Mississippi and Memphis um, to be careful being out there because I'd be out there like 4 a.m. photographing or really early in the morning, um, all times of day. And I don't think he understood that like this is probably one of the safest places. Um, you could be in. Everyone knows everybody. It's not weird to see like six, seven, eight-year-olds walking by the on the street by themselves at night. 
Um, so with that being said, um, I hope this work will continue uh, in ways that are a little bit less literal. I'm not really interested in, in the massacre. Um, I'm more interested in thinking a little bit more imaginary and like um, working in a post-documentary tradition. Um, so maybe leaning into um, some of the traditions of documentary photography, but also mixing it up uh, with intention and also my personal style of how I photograph. Um, this is the only exhibition that this work has been in. So I've been fairly private about this work. Um, it's only, only nine photos have been exhibited. Uh, the work is a little over 100 images at this point. Um, a publication could happen in the future. I'm not really pressed on getting it done. Um, I, I see this work going on for a long time. I also see me, myself taking breaks and then returning. Um, I'm not going to live in Arkansas forever. I will most likely return to a city at some point. Um, so it's something that I, I hope will be very um, long term. OK, so I'm going to talk about this, going back to my thesis. Um, I didn't want my land work to be in my thesis show. I didn't want my work um, inside of a state-funded institution that does not teach kids about Elaine. I am somebody that grew up in Arkansas from second to eighth grade, uh, where you have to take Arkansas state history in junior high, and you have to know about every senator, um, all the way from Reconstruction to now, right? Um, but you never found out about the Elaine massacre or labor issues in the South uh, in general. Um, they just didn't mention it. So I knew I didn't want to show the Elaine work there, and I also thought it would have been really ex very much expected. Um, so throughout my time in grad school, while I'm making work in Elaine, I've also been making other images that is kind of a reaction to my work in Elaine. Um, the work in Elaine was a lot of emotional and physical labor that brought upon depression, anxiety, a lot of things. Um, people aren't meant to drive that much and people aren't meant to, um, yeah, no, I'll just leave it there. Um, but this was a lot of hard work making the work in Elaine. So I needed to take breaks from it. Um, and this work is, this project is the only body of work I've ever made that isn't tied to any history or specific location. Um, and it's really in a bunch, bunch of different places. This is in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I went to school. This is in Lamert Park, Los Angeles. Um, this was an image that I got from South Carolina with an image that I made from Los Angeles. So I was, I was reacting to the work in Elaine, to people's response to the work in Elaine, but also to this aggression that I had and like this inquiry I had behind like black legacies, right? And black history. Um, I realized since I was a kid, like it's hard to look into black history without ending up uh, stumbling across black death. Like either way you, you go down like that tunnel, um, it usually ends up there. So I was thinking a lot about how that, how that inquiry makes you feel and like how that affects your personhood uh, when you're coming across these things, whether in your research or in your personal life. Um, because I was coming across Black Death by making this work, right? So I was commenting on that, but then I was also commenting on my own frustrations within my own practice. Um, my relationship to the image was starting to change. Um, the Elaine work is very traditional. It's black and white, medium and large format film. I'm very meticulous. I develop all my work, I scan all my work, I print all my work. So. I was getting tired of my workflow and I was also getting tired of film entirely. Like it was beginning to bum me out. So I started collaging um, with scans that I was making where I was actually taking uh, parts of the film negatives, parts of real Polaroids, parts of silver gelatin prints, parts of salt prints, cyanotypes, and infusing them together um, in hopes of, in my opinion, um, creating a new black history, a revisioned history, my history. And it was in this show called Failure to Appear where I was, um, I was kind of commenting, the title comes from um, me kind of commenting on my experience in grad school. Um, I was very distant in my grad school program. Um, 
my photo professors were fine with that because they trusted me and they they you know they were right next to me the whole time if I needed any help um, especially in like figuring out the direction of my work um, but I was gone a lot and I was thinking a lot about myself it was probably the most selfish time in my life but it was also the combination of that Elaine COVID the summer of 2020 and what that brought um, and I was thinking a lot about um, black personhood and black survival. So I was thinking about those things. Um, and then while I'm making work in Elaine, I'm getting closer to those ideas. Um, but then I'm also making work outside of Elaine that um, is associated with black survival as well. So this was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, I photographed for the 100th commemoration of 100th anniversary, I should say, of the Black Wall Street Massacre in the Greenwood District of Tulsa uh, for the Atlantic. And that was um, that was interesting to like see how one town is handling the aftermath of a massacre. Granted, it's 100 years later versus Elaine. Tulsa is a much bigger place than Elaine. Um, but they opened up like a really beautiful museum called Greenwood Rising. And you know, I think Elaine is looking to a place like Tulsa as an example, um, but fully acknowledging like it could never, it could never be that way. There's just not enough people there to accommodate that. Um, this is another collage that I made um, with real Polaroids and real prints, and all of the collages are, are physical collages. They they're not like prints of a collage, so they actually have layers on top of them, and they're printed on UV acrylic. Um, this was an image that I made my first semester of grad school. Um, it's my great grandmother's suitcase. Um, and this is something like this is like an object heirloom, if you will, that I brought with me around town, um, like when I was traveling to Elaine. And I didn't use it, um, but it was something I just kept in my car. And that's that's like something I, I tend to do a lot. I think it stems from childhood. Like I keep objects that I seek, that I, I find comfort in, like close to me. Um, and it's something I do to this day. And these are a couple more collages that I made. So I think all of my work is ongoing. I think the Wamala work is ongoing. I think Elaine obviously is definitely ongoing. Uh, this um, will probably never stop. Um, I find comfort in making this work because it gets me out of um, it gets me out of my head with the Elaine work. Um, I have to be very intentional behind the work in Elaine. At least I give myself like that pressure. I put that on myself um, because I'm representing an entire group of people. Um, this, not so much. I have a little bit more freedom or at least I, I allow myself that. And this is how the show looked. Um, I installed it myself, which I was very proud of because I haven't installed a show in like five years. Um, and it's, yeah, so it's mostly prints and then collages on UV acrylic with vinyl attached on the wall. These are the last things I wanna show. Um, this is stuff I made right before my candidacy and I'm also ma making more of these. Um, but I never show these and I'm really excited about them. And this goes back to like my love-hate relationship with film. Um, I recently acquired a bunch of really old 8x10 film from the 1980s and I did not shoot with it. Instead, I like solarized it in my car on my trips to Elaine. So I poked holes in it and just like had it sit in my car. And then I inverted these Polaroids within it. And this is also a physical collage. Um, this is a scan of it but it actually exists in real life. Um, and I call these film studies. And I hope to continue something more abstract like this in the future, because um, I'm very much interested in this as well. But I'm gonna stop there, because I've been talking a lot, but thank you.